back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. The following newspaper article comes from the 13th of December 1995 with the headline, How do you want to die? A single shot or piece by piece with an axe? Three drug barons, executed in a country lane, were offered a chilling choice of how they died. Blasted through the head with a shotgun, or hacked to pieces with an axe. Patrick Tate, Tony Tucker and Craig Rolfe opted for the gun. They were found dead in their Range Rover after a volley of blasts from pump-action weapons. The gangsters' last seconds were outlined yesterday by former associate Steve Nipper Ellis, who was quizzed by police over an unsuccessful bid to murder 18 stone muscle man Tate a year ago. Ellis, 30, said, quote, They were given two options. They could be taken apart with an axe, starting with their fingers, moving onto their hands and then their legs, or they could opt for the quick way out, an execution shot through the back of the head. They were told either way, you're going to get it. There's no escape. Tucker and Tate messed their trousers first, then took the shots. Tate, 37, was executed with two blasts to the head and one in the chest in the back of the car. Tucker, 38, and henchman Rolf, 26, were slumped in the front seats with their brains blown out. Ellis, dubbed Nipper because he is just 5 foot 5 inches tall, confirmed the three were lured to the snow-covered farm track in Retton, Essex, with the promise of another drugs deal. Ellis said... They had double-crossed too many people. They had made too many enemies. They often went to these meets, snatched the supplies and beat up the suppliers. But they did it once too often and were set up themselves. Detectives believe the thugs were driven from the rendezvous spot to the murder scene at gunpoint, then ambushed by at least two other gunmen. Ellis, who has a string of convictions, is a suspect for the triple murder because of his arrest for the earlier attempt on Tate's life. He said, it wasn't me who did the shooting, I just know what happened from a very reliable source. But I'd love to shake the hand of the man who did it. He's my hero, and I'll regret to my dying days that I could not take the credit for it. The first attempt to kill Tate came at his £250,000 bungalow in Basildon, Essex, a year ago. A brick was thrown through the toilet window while Tate was in it. When he peered outside, a gunman opened fire with a revolver from close range. Tate raised his right arm to shield his face. The bullet hit him in the wrist, travelled up his arm and smashed bones in his elbow. Ellis, who had fallen out with Tate and Tucker, said Tate identified me as the gunman, and Tucker and Rolf told the police I chased them with a pump-action shotgun. I was arrested, but the case was never pursued because Chex ruled out my gun as the weapon. But Pat Tate was 100% sure it was me and swore revenge. Ellis told how he fell out with Tucker and Tate last year. He said, quote, It was all over some silly remark I made on the phone. Next thing I knew, Tucker and Rolf came round to my home in Essex. Tucker stuck a loaded pistol into my temple and threatened to kill me. They then came after me with a machete and threatened to hack off my hand and foot. They then looted my house and left their filth plastered over the stuff they left behind. I couldn't take any more of it and went out and bought a Smith & Wesson for £600 and a bulletproof vest for £400. I might be small, but someone had to stand up to them. Ellis told how after the attempt on Tate's life, he was invited to meet Tate in hospital to sort out a misunderstanding. But he found out Tate had a gun hidden in his hospital bed and was planning to execute Ellis as he stepped through the door. Tate was later jailed for smuggling the weapon into the hospital Ellis has been laying low in the West Country since August after serving seven and a half months in jail for illegally possessing firearms. Wearing sunglasses to disguise his identity, he said, When I was in jail, I had numerous death threats. 
On one occasion, two men came up to me and told me a £10,000 contract had been put out on me. As soon as I got out of prison, I was ordered to leave town. I was told if I ignored the warnings, they would retaliate. A hitman went to my dad's door looking for me. My family were told that Tucker and Tate planned to snatch my little sister and take off her fingers one by one. She was only 15 and terrified. The threats never stopped and the last one was only two weeks ago. These people were nasty, vicious bullies. They will not be missed. They were scum and Britain is a much better place without them. My dad was crying tears of joy when he heard they'd been murdered. The following newspaper article comes from the 15th of December 1995 with the headline Drug War. A gangland war could sweep across Essex in the wake of the killing of three known drug dealers police have warned. Detectives are investigating the possibility the shooting of mobsters Rolf, Tucker and Basildon man Pat Tate on an isolated farm track near Chelmsford may be linked to a string of incidents this year involving the criminal underworld. Known criminals Tate 37, Rolf 26 from Chafford 100 and 38-year-old Tony Tucker from Fobbing were gunned down in cold blood in Rolf's Range Rover last Wednesday evening. All three had a long history of criminal activity. Police believe the trio may have been muscling in on the county's drug scene. Now detectives are appealing for other criminals to come forward with information before the situation worsens. Rolf's girlfriend, Donna Jaggers, who shared his Chafford 100 home, joined officers to make her own tearful plea for information. She begged, Anyone who knows anything, or saw anything, could they just come forward, because we need all the help we can get. The shootings have been linked to another in October at St Andrew's Hospital, Billa Ricky, when a man dressed as a clown walked into the hospital and shot a patient being treated for burns after an acid attack. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley, leading the hunt, said, We are prepared for an all-out turf war sweeping through Essex. We are already linking this incident with others in Essex. There could be other incidents yet. Another gang may step in to take over the void left behind by the three shootings. Detective Superintendent Ivan Dibley could not confirm if the incident was connected with the ecstasy pill which claimed Leah Betts' life last month but he hinted the three were high up in the drugs hierarchy. Police are appealing for anyone with information about the murders to contact the incident room. Two youths aged 17 were arrested on Friday and charged with selling Leah Betts the killer tablet and have been bailed to appear before magistrates on January the 10th. The following newspaper article comes from the 23rd of February 1996 with the headline the crazed drugs giant who had to die. One of three drug dealers, cold-bloodedly executed in Essex, was killed because he was going berserk on drugs and trying to muscle in on the turf of other criminals police have revealed. Patrick Tate, 37, had become dangerously deluded and out of control after embarking on a massive drugs binge on his release from prison six weeks before his death. Described as a giant of a man, he took heroin, cocaine, cannabis and ecstasy in large amounts, as well as pumping himself full of steroids to build his body up to its huge size. Detective Inspector Ivan Dibley, who is leading the murder investigation, said, He was by nature a violent man, and with the use of these drugs, he was becoming more or less totally out of control. I believe he was the catalyst for the killing. He was trying to muscle in on a fairly slick organisation which had been running quite well without him and he was upsetting the apple cart. We know of one or two instances where he attacked people while running amok on drugs and he had ruffled the feathers of other gang members since his release from prison. Police believe the two other victims, Craig Rolfe, 26 and Tony Tugger, 38, might simply have been in the wrong place at the wrong time. The following newspaper article comes from the 15th of September 1997 with the headline Tables are turned on police supergrass. A supergrass at the centre of a triple murder trial had the tables turned on him when a defence barrister accused him of pulling the trigger. Darren Nichols, 32, had told the Old Bailey jury he was the unwitting getaway driver for the ruthless killings in Workhouse Lane, Rettenden. 
He claimed Steele, 54, and Jack Wombs, 36, fired the fatal shots on December the 6th, 1995. Both men deny killing drug barons Tony Tucker, 38, of High Road Fobbing, Craig Rolfe, 26, of Kelshot Avenue, Chafford, 100, and Pat Tate, 37, of Gordon Road, Basildon. Graham Parkins, QC, defending Steele, asked Nichols, Were you involved in these murders yourself with other men? An angry Nichols replied, I've told you. I picked them up from the murders they committed. I was badly affected by it. Nichols, a police informer, was arrested by detectives in May 1996 on a cannabis charge. During interviews with officers, he claimed Wombs and Steele had carried out the Rettenden murders and the pair were eventually charged. Mr Parkins responded, You told those officers you didn't really want anything to do with Mr Steele after the killings. You had been duped into ferrying men to and from a triple shooting. If you are telling the truth, an awful and evil thing has been done to you. Nichols said, that's right. Mr Parkins continued, still would hardly be on your Christmas card list. Nichols, no. Can you explain him why you sent his family a card for Christmas 1995? You also gave this man you claim was a killer a case of canned beer and a bottle of wine. Nichols said, yes, but only because he gave my children a present. Mr Parkins told the court that Nichols had been given a radio-controlled aeroplane for Christmas and two days later was at Steele's house flying it in his garden. Nichols admitted it was true. Quote, he said he should fly it because he's a pilot, but he crashed it several times into a tree. Mr Parkins added, isn't it true that you then took your little girls to the house of this triple killer so they could watch the rabbits run in the garden? Steele sat laughing in the dock as Nichols replied quietly, Yes. Nichols, a trained electrician, also admitted he continued working on the renovation of Steele's new home in St Mary's Road, Great Bentley, Essex, for several months after the murders. And despite telling police he had tried to avoid Steele, telephone records were produced in court to show Nichols had phoned him twice in the week following the killings. The trial continues.